Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Steve Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is Chief of the Division of Cardiac Critical Care Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Steve, welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Really happy to be here. Steve, um, my first question uh, for you is this. Um, colleagues around the world, I suspect like I, have an intuitive framework about our approach to low cardiac output syndrome. But you've been doing this for 20 years um, in some of the highest volume cardiac intensive care units in the world. How should we uh, structure our framework in thinking about um, the child with low cardiac output syndrome? So when I start to think of the framework then of how I apply treatment to these patients, really you can ask the question, what is heart failure in the ICU? So we all know the definition that we learned in medical school, which is that heart failure is the inability of the cardiovascular system to meet the oxygen delivery demands of the body. But in the sense of what we really see at the bedside, while yes, we do see low cardiac output and low oxygen delivery, we kind of see a, a constellation of findings. We see respiratory symptoms, so respiratory distress is often a big piece of the, the ICU patient with heart failure. Now, the simple way that we like to think and teach about low cardiac output in, the, in any state is, you know, we all know the equation, cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. And we know that stroke volume is dependent on preload, afterload, and contractility. And so we tend to present these as very straightforward concepts. And I do want to take a minute and talk about those and introduce those, because we do need to understand the basics before we move on to some of the more complex things that we have to consider at the bedside. So the place that we start in teaching this physiology is with the idea of the pressure volume loop. And this is an example of a typical left ventricular pressure volume loop. And this shows, uh, ventricular volume on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. And if you start in the uh, lower left corner, uh, you see diastolic filling where the ventricle fills at a very steady low pressure. And then at the end of diastole, the pressure starts to go up a little bit uh, until the mitral valve closes. You then have the period of isovolumic contraction where pressure rises quickly. Uh, but volume doesn't change until the aortic valve opens and then you get systolic emptying. And during that time, the volume decreases while the pressure initially rises a bit and then starts to fall. And as it falls, the aortic valve closes and now you're into the period of isovolumic relaxation where uh, pressure declines rapidly uh, without a change in volume. When you look at, at uh, ventricular function represented this way, the length uh, on the x-axis, the volume length between the line representing isovolumic relaxation and isovolumic contraction is the stroke volume. That's the, the amount the ventricle both fills in diastole and empties during systole. We can then take this loop and look at it under different conditions and understand how different conditions affect stroke volume. So the first concept, and again, many people are very familiar with this, the Frank Starling concept of the heart, if you increase preload, you increase stroke volume. So you can see in this pair of pressure volume loops, what I've done is I've shown that as you increase the volume filling in diastole, the ventricle ejects to the same end systolic volume and the stroke volume is therefore increased. And uh, we're all taught that this is a function of uh, optimizing overlap between actin and myosin in the myocytes. The concept of afterload is also very important and especially important in heart failure patients. And we're gonna talk about this a lot more as we go on. So afterload affects stroke volume in the opposite way of preload. Increasing afterload decreases stroke volume. And in this pair of loops, we again have our baseline pressure volume loop. And then we have a loop with increased afterload where the ventricle has to generate more pressure before it can start to eject. So this would be a case where there is vasoconstriction or in congenital heart disease, coarctation of the aorta or aortic stenosis compared to a normal situation. And the ventricle generates more pressure, but it actually ejects to a higher end systolic volume. The actual end systolic volume to which it can eject is determined by contractility, and I'll explain that next. But the key point here from this figure is increasing afterload decreases stroke volume. Therefore, decreasing afterload increases stroke volume. When we try to represent contractility, again, we have two curves here, and uh, one is the baseline one in blue, the other one in green, 
represents a failing left ventricle. And what you can see is that this is essentially shifted up and to the right, and that uh, the failing left ventricle operates often at a higher volume, end diastolic volume. Uh, it operates at a higher end diastolic pressure. Uh, but when we talk about contractility, if we build a family of these curves at different afterloads, what you would see is that the end systolic pressure volume point lines up on a, on a line with a certain slope. That line is abbreviated EES, which stands for end systolic elastance. And the key, the key feature of end systolic elastance is that it's a load independent measure of ventricular contractility. This is something that's very hard to estimate at the bedside because we can't simply generate a, a, a family of these curves. But it, a key feature of this is it's important to understand that the things that we often do use at the bedside, like echo measured stroke volume or shortening fraction or ejection fraction, uh, are in fact load dependent measures of contractility. They depend on preload and afterload and they don't necessarily tell you about the intrinsic state of the heart. But when the heart does have decreased contractility and you generate a different family of these curves, you would see here with the green line, this has a lower slope. This represents a lower contractile state. You may be able to move from one contractile state to another by using drugs such as inotropes. But contractility is ultimately an intrinsic property of the heart. Uh, and when I talked in the previous slide about how afterload affects stroke volume, it is this, the slope of this end systolic elastance line that determines where that end systolic pressure volume point is and what your stroke volume is for a given afterload. Additionally, when the heart fails, it's not just what happens in systole, it's what happens in diastole. And you can see uh, in this curve that is shifted upward and to the right that the end diastolic pressure volume point is at a higher volume and a much higher pressure. And that leads to some of the respiratory symptoms that we see, such as pulmonary edema. And that's an important aspect of, of these hearts. In addition, uh, high end diastolic volume is also an afterload stress on the heart, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Steve, that was a very clear overview, um, demonstrating through the pressure volume loops really the mechanisms of um, normal cardiac function, stroke volume, and um, really the response of the failing heart. And so the question arises, how do you translate this to the bedside? For example, uh, one could conclude from the um, end diastolic pressure volume relationship in the failing heart that we should be giving uh, fluid. Uh, but of course, that's not always the case, it's not the first approach, or it's not even the wisest approach. So how do you translate this physiology to the bed space? So I think one of the key things is the way that I've just explained this really provides a framework for understanding uh, how the ventricle behaves in very ideal conditions when you can change one thing without changing others. But as we know at the bedside, especially in critically ill patients, that's not really the way things work. And that these, these concepts become very interrelated. So I want to take some time to kind of explain how that happens. Additionally, um, there is some evidence that the failing heart may be entirely different from a physiologic standpoint. So some of the key things I want to talk about, preload, afterload, and contractility uh, are not always independent of each other in real life. Now, starting at the beginning, we'll talk about loading and contractility. So I've told you that afterload reduction improves stroke volume. And that really is a key tenet of how we manage failing ventricles in the ICU. That said, it's not, uh, it's not something that is free of potential risk and cost. So we need to remember that coronary perfusion pressure, at least for the left ventricle, is equal to the diastolic blood pressure minus the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. I've already told you that the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is higher in heart failure patients often. Additionally, uh, when, they're very, when they're critically ill, their diastolic blood pressure might in fact be low. And so you're running in a, in a, in a place where coronary perfusion pressure may be at, at the risk of becoming critically low. And so we can't completely neglect that as we reduce afterload. Uh, the overall uh, effect of coronary perfusion depends on the exact nature of the vasculature and on the LV function. But I think the key thing here at the bedside is when you see a patient in low output with poor ventricular function who has a very, who has a normal to high blood pressure, it's really important that we bring that blood pressure down to if we want to improve cardiac output. If that blood pressure is low, you're in a whole different situation. I also mentioned before that increasing preload increases stroke volume. So as you correctly asked, 
you know, why don't we just give tons of volume to patients in heart failure? I mean, we all know that's the wrong thing to do. We're taught that from day one of you know, cardiac pathophysiology in medical school. And the reason is these ventricles are already dilated. Uh, and increasing that, that uh, diameter even more actually increases wall stress. So we tend to think of wall stress as related to blood pressure, and it is. But wall stress is actually determined by the law of Laplace, which uh, states not only that, that uh, the afterload against which the ventricle pumps is related to blood pressure, or the, the difference in pressure between uh, the outside of the ventricle and the inside of the ventricle, but it's also related uh, to the diameter of the ventricle, directly related to the diameter of the ventricle. So a very dilated ventricle, in fact, has more afterload on it. Um, so simply dilating it more can be very counterproductive. Additionally, there's some interesting data that, that's been around for quite a while. Uh, this is a paper from 1994 that demonstrates a really interesting phenomenon. So this group uh, took explanted hearts that were being transplanted. And they looked at healthy hearts that were explanted for transplant but couldn't be used. And they looked at explanted hearts that were the failing, that were going to be replaced. So donor hearts, potential donor hearts, and recipient explant hearts. And they took muscle strips from these hearts and they increased preload on them and saw what kind of tension they developed. And what you can see here in, with the open squares shows that the normal hearts behaved normally. So the more you stretch them, the more tension they developed, exactly what the Frank Starling mechanisms would predict. The failing hearts responded entirely differently. You stretch them more, and they didn't do anything different. They didn't develop any more tension. In fact, uh, at maximal stretch, they were still developing less tension than the healthy hearts at the minimal stretch. And I think that's really important, because what that means is if you give volume to somebody in heart failure, you get no increase in stroke volume, unless they are dehydrated, you get no increase in stroke volume, and uh, in fact, you increase your afterload at the same time. So you get none of the beneficial effects of increased preload, and you get potentially the detrimental effects of increased afterload. Uh, in addition, um, when we start talking about interactions within the cardiovascular system, another really important thing to understand uh, are ventricular vascular interactions. And this comes back sort of, if you connect the end diastolic pressure volume point and the end systolic pressure volume point, you get a line with a different slope. And that is called the arterial elastance. And that's actually a measure of the uh, vascular impedance to blood flow. And the steeper that line, the higher your systemic vascular resistance or vascular impedance, the higher your arterial elastance. And what you really want, you would like to live in a situation where your uh, end systolic elastance, your ventricular contractility, far exceeds the work your vasculature is asking it to do. And this is really nicely demonstrated by another older study. What they did was they took patients, healthy patients, patients with compensated heart failure, and patients with decompensated heart failure, and they measured their end systolic elastance and their arterial elastance. And the upper figure here shows that the normal heart, the healthy patients, their heart works at peak energy efficiency. The slope of the end systolic elastance line, the absolute value of that slope, exceeds the slope of the arterial elastance. The normal heart uh, is able to meet really anything the vasculature throws at it in, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. That's you know, why you can exercise. That's why you have cardiovascular reserve to handle a variety of things. You know, when you get nervous and your blood pressure goes up, your heart doesn't give out. Uh, the, comp the compensated failing heart, so someone with diminished contractility, but who's you know, walking around, living life, you know, not necessarily in the hospital, not in need of a lot of support, uh, that heart works at peak work efficiency. And it turns out that the slope, the absolute value of the slope of the end systolic elastance line is about the same as the absolute value of the slope of the arterial elastance line. The ratio is one. In the decompensated heart failure patient, which is what we tend to see in the ICU, afterload exceeds contractility. This is an inefficient heart. It can't do the work the vasculature is demanding of it. And you see here a very flat slope to the end systolic elastance line and a much steeper slope to the arterial elastance line. And that's why so long as your blood pressure permits, again, giving afterload reduction starts to reduce that slope of the arterial elastance line. And giving an inotrope might increase the slope of the end systolic elastance line. In other words, Inotropes increase contractility, vasodilators decrease 
afterload, and you get at least hopefully back to that compensated heart failure state. Additionally, um, we want to look at ventricular-ventricular interactions, and these are really important. When one ventricle becomes very dilated, it's very hard for the other ventricle to fill. And so uh, one of the things you see in heart failure patients is that as the left ventricle becomes pro progressively dysfunctional, left atrial pressure goes up, pulmonary artery pressure goes up, and eventually the right ventricle begins to fail, and these patients start to get a lot sicker. And so uh, what you can see in this study here that was published in The Lancet in 1997 uh, is you can see uh, two cartoons. One, uh, the upper one here, is of sort of a normal uh, LV-RV relationship where both ventricles are occupying their own space doing their own thing. In the bottom diagram here, you can see the failing heart where the RV is dilated. So the, the LV is dysfunctional, but now the RV has become dysfunctional as well. The septum is shifted over into the left ventricle and actually impairs left ventricular filling. And this was identified in this study by a restrictive filling pattern uh, on the echocardiogram. So they used uh, a device that essentially applied negative pressure to the lower body, which acutely volume unloaded the right side of the heart. It's as if you, you put a cath an arterial line in and you suddenly took out or, or I should say a central venous line, and suddenly took out a whole bunch of blood from the venous side. And what they found was that by echo, they were able to change the shift of the septum. The septum moved back over into the right ventricle where it's supposed to be, and the LV was the more rounded ventricle rather than the RV. And this had important clinical consequences. So what they found was that in the heart failure patients who are, so I'm looking now at the figure here on the left, the dots on the right represent heart failure patients. The dots on the left represent healthy controls. And what they're demonstrating here is the change in left ventricular end diastolic volume with acute volume unloading of the right side of the heart. In healthy patients, when they acutely volume unloaded the right side of the heart, perhaps not surprisingly, the left ventricle also lost volume because the right ventricle didn't have it to pump to the left ventricle. But interestingly, in the patients who had heart failure and dilated right ventricles, when they acutely reduced volume to the right side, the left ventricle, in fact, filled better because it had room to fill, even though the right ventricle was less loaded. If you look at the figure on the right here, it shows pulmonary capillary wedge pressure on the x-axis versus the change in left ventricular end diastolic volume. And what you can see is that, essentially, uh, the higher the wedge pressure, in other words, the more compressed the LV was, the more effect this technique had. So that really points out that this effect of preload becomes very complex when you start to include ventricular-ventricular interactions. The pressure volume loop I showed at the beginning just shows you an isolated left ventricle, but that's not really how the world works. These patients have two ventricles, and in fact, acutely unloading the right ventricle, in fact, gives preload to the left ventricle and helps it improve its output. And furthermore, when you broke these patients down into those who had restrictive filling versus non-restrictive filling in their LV, it was the patients with a restrictive LV filling who really benefited the most. So one of the take-home lessons here is if your cardiologists are telling you that this patient has restrictive filling in the LV, make, making sure that the RV isn't becoming overdistended and interfering with LV filling becomes a critical part of management. Uh, I'm going to switch to something we haven't talked about so much, which is heart rate. So heart rate interacts with these principles as well. So uh, first, at a very simple level, when you're very tachycardic, you don't have a lot of time in diastole for diastolic filling. Now, that said, you may need your heart rate to keep your cardiac output, and there's some bedside judgment that you may have to make. But it's also important to recognize that the healthy heart uh, increases its contractility as it increases its heart rate. This is something called the force frequency relationship, and it's caused by changes in calcium transients that affect both inotropy and chronotropy. Um, however, the failing heart doesn't behave this way. Additionally, as it affects our practice in pediatrics, there is some data, not to the extent that there is in adults with heart failure, that neonates may also not have this relationship, uh, at least in the same way that adult heart hearts do because neonates have an immature calcium handling apparatus. So also important to recognize tachycardia uh, uh, may be actually a detriment rather than particularly beneficial in certain of our populations. 
This is another study similar to the one I showed before in isolated heart fibers comparing failing and non-failing hearts. And what you see, again, in the upper, upper line here, upper figure, is that as you increase stimulation frequency of the heart muscle fibers, the healthy heart reacts just like you predict it would. It increases the amount of tension that it generates. The failing heart does the opposite. As you increase the stimulation frequency, it in fact generates less tension. So tachycardia in heart failure patients is a particularly worrisome thing. Now, in patients who are in acute shock, you have to be very careful about acutely lowering the heart rate. And this is certainly something that needs to be done, uh, oftentimes looking at, at echo and very carefully and in consultation with specialists in, in heart failure as well. I don't want to give the impression that somebody who's presenting in acute shock with a heart rate of 200 needs a beta blocker as their first treatment. So again, uh, it's really important uh, that we at least take these relationships into account as we treat these patients uh, in the ICU. So Steve, I'm sure the question that uh, many colleagues are wondering around the world is, so what is your stepwise approach to, uh, to treating the child uh, with heart failure? You know, what do you think about first, second, third, et cetera? We'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. Could you first please tell us your city and country location? And the question is this, what is your therapeutic approach to treating the child with heart failure? Specifically, what are your stepwise targets and what medications do you turn to? We're back now with Dr. Schwartz. There have been a lot of studies in adults targeting things like blood pressure and CVP and mixed venous saturation, and it turns out that targeting those don't do any better than just asking the patient how they feel. Sometimes a bit trickier in small babies, but you know you can get a sense, can they tolerate feeds? You know, are they interactive with you? How are they feeling today? What's their breathing pattern like? I do want to put in a word first about diuretics, because I think that they're often uh, if the patient is having respiratory symptoms, they're often something that can make the patient feel a lot better and look a lot better. Sometimes there's a lot of worry about giving diuretics to patients who are in heart failure and whose perfusion isn't great. But for the reasons that we talked about, about acutely unloading a right ventricle, for example, uh, change in chamber diameter and a smaller heart uh, being better for cardiac output, and then finally, just the simple notion that pulmonary edema makes it hard for you to breathe, a single dose of Lasix can be really an excellent treatment uh, for a patient in heart failure. But when we start to get into the sicker sort of cardiogenic shock patients, we, re we really start to use inotropes. So this cartoon here demonstrates some of the effects of beta agonists on the heart. And I just want to go through this briefly so that we have this basic understanding as we go through. And, and this suggests why inotropes can be as helpful as they are. So primarily in the heart are beta agonists that we use uh, bind to the beta-1 receptor this couple to stimulatory G proteins, and then that in turn activates adenylyl cyclase, which builds up cyclic AMP in the heart. And that has a number of, of secondary effects that we think are really important. It improves uh, actin-myosin interaction. It improves uh, reuptake of calcium uh, in diastole. Uh, it uh, affects calcium entry into the cell in systole, a whole bunch of things that make contractility and maybe even relaxation a bit better. And so that all sounds good. And so we love inotropes. And we know that when we give our patients inotropes, acutely they look better and they feel better. Besides beta agonists, I think this is a good place to introduce the idea of milrinone, uh, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Phosphodiesterase 3 in the heart breaks down the cyclic AMP and milrinone inhibits that process. So it's not a beta agonist, but essentially its effects are all this, are the same as beta agonists. It's just working by a different mechanism. And it's probably the drug that we use the most in these patients. Um, I want to draw attention to the concept of blood pressure and perfusion for a second uh, before we go into the specific inotropes. So hypotension is really something that happens very late in cardiogenic shock. This is a figure taken from the PALS instructor book. Uh, and it's a model of uh, hemorrhagic shock, not cardiogenic shock. But it demonstrates the point quite nicely. And what you can see is that cardiac output represented with the white line falls long before blood pressure falls. And that's because your systemic resistance goes up. Again, we've talked about the relationship between systemic resistance and afterload on the one hand and cardiac output on the other. And it's just important to remember that a good blood pressure isn't the same as good perfusion. And when you have room to maneuver, uh, lowering blood pressure can be important. And secondly, hypotension is a very late and dire finding. So what about inotropes? Well, they do seem like a good way to help. 
and I've said I think they're really important drug in cardiogenic shock, and I still want to emphasize that because I'm going to say several things right now that are sort of warning sign, warnings about using inotropes as well. So inotropes improve contractility, they increase cardiac output, they can actually lower end diastolic pressure, some reduce afterload like milrinone or low-dose epinephrine, you know, very 0.02, 0.03 mics per kilo per minute, can have vasodilatory properties, dobutamine. Uh, and they definitely make patients feel better. Almost every study of giving people inotropes and asking how they feel, uh, they feel better if they have heart failure and they get started on an inotrope. So this is a subject that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1991, and it's a very instructive study, and it really changed the way people thought about long-term inotropes. It was over a thousand adult subjects with chronic heart failure. They were given 40 milligrams of oral milrinone daily. This, these are the survival curves. You can see that they were worse in the milrinone patients rather than the placebo patients, and I'll point out that all measured outcomes were worse in the patients who got chronic milrinone. Uh, and this was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. So suggesting that there's something about long-term exposure to inotropes that's actually bad for you. Now, I will say that most, that, that most adult studies have a large number of patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, and that's not something that we see in pediatrics. And it is possible that issues with oxygen supply and demand within the myocardium have something to do with this. But even in pediatrics, I think many centers have started to move away from the idea of treating somebody who has poor function but not a lot of symptoms with inotropes, really trying to get by with diuretics and get people on the, the stable heart failure drugs we'll talk about soon, and really using inotropes only for those short-term instances where the patient is, is really clearly in low cardiac output. And needing an inotrope, being stuck on an inotrope, unable to wean from it in the ICU is a very bad prognostic sign. So dobutamine, studies with dobutamine show 28 to 30 percent, 180 day mortality. Oral milrinone, 34% increase in cardiovascular mortality compared to placebo. Even the levosimendin trials have 26% 180-day mortality, um, and other drugs that have been tried are similar. So clearly being stuck in the ICU on an inotrope is a very, very concerning situation. So when you explore a little further into what the American Heart Association says about inotropes for chronic heart failure, long-term use of an infusion of a positive inotropic drug may be harmful and is not recommended for patients with current or prior symptoms of heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, except as palliation for patients with end-stage disease who cannot be stabilized with standard medical treatment. Um, and that's even level of evidence C. So that's really, you know, at, at the end of, inotropes are our last resort, not our first line in chronic heart failure. Certainly in shock, they are. So to be clear, I'm not saying don't use inotropes. Inotropes can do several useful things. They, the way that I phrase this in teaching it at the bedside is inotropes will probably help your patient live until tomorrow, uh, next week, and maybe the next few months. So if that is your immediate concern, that this patient is going to die unless I do something dramatic, now inotropes, absolutely. Um, if it is, this patient has an ugly looking echo um, and uh, you know they can't walk up the stairs, they probably should not be getting inotropes. Um, uh, they will certainly make your patient feel better acutely, but again, to emphasize, the, the need, the, the inability to get off of inotropes is a warning sign that worsening is inevitable, uh, and that patient needs to be referred to a center uh, or a program uh, re where they can get evaluated for heart transplantation uh, or mechanical support. So Steve, um, I want to ask you a question about positive pressure. Um, you were very clear in uh, describing the law of Laplace and that at the end of diastole, the free wall stops. And now in order to enter uh, systole, the free wall's got to eject against a vector. And it's that uh, difference between the intercavitary pressure and the pleural pressure that's the work that the ventricle must um, eject against and in effect the afterload. Um, and so that leads to the question of how aggressive are you with positive pressure? Uh, given that physiology. I could make up uh, a story where you apply it early and frequently to unload the LV. Um, can you describe for us how you think about it? We'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. In your response, could you first please write your city and country location? And the question is this. In your ICU, do you routinely use positive pressure ventilation in the management of patients with heart failure? If so, in which subset of patients? We're back now with Dr. Schwartz.
Yeah, I, positive pressure clearly has a role in heart failure, and I think it's having an increasing role as we get better non-invasive ways of delivering positive pressure. So certainly in the ICU, you know, we can deliver it however we need to. Um, as you mentioned, the law of Laplace uh, shows that afterload is really proportional to the transmural pressure. So going from negative intrathoracic pressure to positive intrathoracic pressure reduces that afterload. In addition, what's been discovered over the last several years is that there are a number of respiratory disorders in heart failure patients. I don't know that there's any evidence that this is true for babies, but certainly for teenagers, uh, it does start to factor into the mix. Um, you know, or even some of our more complex populations like muscular dystrophy patients, for example, who are prone to heart failure. So we know that certainly heart failure patients can have pulmonary edema and decreased lung compliance and increased work of breathing. Uh, they can be susceptible to pulmonary hypertension and hypoventilation for a variety of reasons. And we know that sleep disordered breathing is very common in heart failure patients. So there has been a, an interest not just in the acute, you know, uh, cardiogenic shock patient where there's a, maybe a need to intubate them. There's been an, uh, an increasing recognition of uh, sleep disorders in heart failure patients and a recognition that as we develop better non-invasive ways of uh, ventilating these patients, that even electively, you know, at least trials of CPAP at night, for example, uh, can be very helpful to some of these patients. You know, I certainly think that uh, someone who is deteriorating and developing respiratory distress, it's reasonable to try non-invasive ventilation, although that probably needs to be done in a setting where you can rapidly move to intubation if that becomes necessary if the patient is still deteriorating. I will make mention that actually intubating a patient with low cardiac output in heart failure is a very, very high risk proposition. Uh, it may be absolutely necessary. We have all seen kids where uh, they are in low output and we intubate them, and immediately their perfusion improves. Um, and so, you know, fitting our understanding of the cardiopulmonary interactions at play, but sometimes giving the anesthetic uh, and getting the tube in is, is fraught with risk. And so uh, it is very important to recognize this is a high-risk situation. You do need, uh, you know, code meds drawn up. Um, if you're in an ECMO center, it's not unusual that you'll have your ECMO circuit nearby, you'll make sure a surgeon is available in case a patient crashes. Hopefully, you know, that's over preparation and you don't need that very often, but it's not out of the question as a consequence of trying to intubate one of these patients. I'll just draw your attention to one study here that kind of uh, demonstrates uh, some of the benefits of positive pressure ventilation. The lower figure here uh, looks at pleural pressure in heart failure patients, both off and on ventilatory support. And what you can see is how much the pleural pressure oscillation dampens when you go on positive pressure. So while pa even patients who are breathing comfortably to your ability to assess that may benefit from non-invasive ventilation, clearly patients who are working to breathe and generating large negative intrathoracic pressures <sighs> with a breath are really going to benefit potentially even more because those large negative intrathoracic pressures actually widen that transmural pressure gradient. So, um, and in addition, if you're having trouble with oxygen delivery, just decreasing the work of breathing can also be an important component of matching your oxygen supply with your oxygen demand. So Steve, uh, finally, um, when do we transition to more long-term therapies, beta blockers, ACE inhibition, et cetera? So uh, I think, so th these are clearly two two sets of drugs where there's a ton of evidence that getting patients with heart failure on these drugs over a long period helps them live longer with their own heart before they need transplantation. And so absolutely, as the AHA guidelines recommend, as you suggest in your question, this is really where we want to try to go with these patients, get them off inotropes and get them on stable doses of these medications. So the when um, in somebody who's presented in cardiogenic shock uh, can be a little bit tricky, and I think that's an important consideration of the treating team, they, they have their own risks. So ACE inhibitors certainly have risks in, with regard to renal function. And you'd like to see that the patient's been stable, that they have stable renal function, uh, and that uh, they probably have a little bit in that room in their blood pressure to tolerate an ACE inhibitor, which is also a vasodilator. But if they can, these drugs have been shown to reduce fibrosis of the ventricle, uh, and they certainly have been associated with better long-term outcomes. As far as ACE inhibitors in children, the main piece of data really comes from an, a single ventricle trial, which is not the same as a standard heart failure population. It was a trial 
uh, done through the Pediatric Heart Network of the National Institutes of Health uh, and, and National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And this was a trial that randomized children with single ventricle lesions to ACE inhibitors or not, uh, and looked at growth at 14 months of age, but also looked at a variety of hemodynamic parameters and really found no difference with ACE inhibitors. Now, whether that can be extrapolated to a heart failure population is hard to say. Um, and I would say that use of ACE inhibitors is uh, in patient, in, certainly in places where there are more advanced heart failure programs, they try universally to get patients on ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers tend to make intensivists at least a little more nervous. We talked about heart rate and why slower heart rates may be important in heart failure, pa heart failure patients. Uh, and we talked about why beta agonists may be bad for you. So there's a whole host of reasons, biochemical reasons, as well as physiologic reasons why beta blockade may in fact be good. And this is really an enormous change over the last 20 years. It is important not to give a beta blocker to somebody in acute shock. Uh, so you want your patient to be hemodynamically stable and you'd like to see that they have weaned off and tolerated a wean off of your inotropes. At that point, you can start to slowly introduce a beta blocker. Uh, Bob Shaddy, uh, uh, did a very nice uh, randomized trial of carvedilol in pediatric heart failure patients. Um, 161 patients randomized to placebo or one of two doses of carvedilol. The primary endpoint was heart failure status at eight months. These were patients with an ejection fraction of less than 40%, and half of the patients were less than two years, of, two years old. So really the kind of population that we want to know about in pediatrics. Disappointingly, uh, carvedilol uh, did not have an improved effect compared to placebo. The important caveat here is that the ejection fraction improved significantly in both the carvedilol and the placebo groups. We would not have expected the placebo group to improve. So, you know, it's a little unclear, you know, where maybe there's some myocarditis patients who are going to improve otherwise. Um, I think people are still routinely using beta blockers in stable, in patients once they've gotten stable and off their inotropes. Um, the only c other caution I would give is in that study, the one group that did seem to do worse were groups with single right ventricles. So hypoplastic left heart patients, you know, older Fontan patients, for example, with single right ventricles. So uh, we probably still need to exercise a fair amount of caution uh, in that group with beta blockers. But I think that the this adult mix of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors for stable heart failure patients is being more and more widely applied in pediatrics. Um, there really haven't been any new drugs uh, other than those in quite some time. Uh, however, uh, the timing of this discussion that we're having is fortuitous because really just in the last few weeks, uh, there was a, a, a trial that was presented uh, and then published in the New England Journal of a new angiotensin naprilosin uh, inhibitor agent, combined agent, uh, versus enalapril in heart failure patients. And in fact, this drug actually seemed to be superior to enalapril in a whole number of, of uh, uh, ways in terms of, uh, of endpoints. The um, naprilosin, uh, is, naprilosin inhibition increases the availability of natriuretic peptides in the body. So it essentially allows some of the body's own heart failure compensatory mechanisms to potentially work better. If this drug does get approved, it's not approved yet, but if it does get approved, it will be the first uh, new approved agent for heart failure in, in many years. So that's sort of where we want to go with stable heart failure patients. So finally, Steve, um, patients who don't improve on medications, in some centers, the option of mechanical support is available. Uh, what is the state of mechanical support for infants and children uh, in the current era? We'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. In your response, could you first write your city and country location? And the question is this. In your ICU, do you have the capacity for mechanical support, such as ECMO or a ventricular assist device? If so, what are your criteria for placing patients with heart failure on such support? If you do not have the capacity for mechanical support, at what point do you consider transferring a patient to a center with those capabilities? We're back now with Dr. Schwartz. Uh, so, um, you know, we've certainly had a lot of experience with ECMO now for, uh, for several decades. Um, the thing about ECMO, as you know, it's really a short-term solution, um, and this, and outside of you know, myocarditis perhaps or acute postoperative cardiac dysfunction, the kinds of problems we've been talking about are long-term problems. And so there has been a search for other ways to support these kids. And uh, you know, we, in adults, 
there have been ventricular assist devices available for many years now. And we've finally started to be able to, to miniaturize these devices and make them suitable for implantation in children. Uh, there was a study uh, published in 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, a, a trial, if you will, of a pediatric ventricular assist device, the Berlin Heart Device. Um, this was not a randomized trial. I don't think anybody felt ethically they could randomize children to ECMO versus VAD. Uh, but they certainly looked at a cohort of patients uh, who were supported mechanically with ECMO versus uh, the this ventricular assist device. And uh, Really, it was very unusual to have anybody on ECMO more than 20 days for cardiac support. Either they came off or they died. Um, but 20 days is much shorter than the average waiting time for a heart transplant most places. In fact, probably any place. Whereas uh, patients have been able to be stabilized on ventricular assist devices for weeks and months. And uh, for some of our older patients who can get uh, different devices that are a little more compact or where the uh, the driving lines and driving devices are a bit more compact, they uh, can even go home with these devices. And certainly adult patients do go home with these devices. And they can certainly get out of our ICUs. They can be off of ventilators. So even the ones that are still confined to the hospital, you know, in our hospital, it's not unusual that they, go, they at least go down to the cafeteria occasionally for their meals. If it's a nice day uh, with the right medical accompaniment, they actually go for a walk outside. You know, and that's a, a really big important part of having a patient who is really ready for a heart transplant when that comes and who's, who's you know, maintained their muscle strength and maintained their uh, psychological health as best they can. So these are, you know, these are really revolutionary devices. Um, I think the criteria for placing these devices in pediatric patients is still evolving. So you're not going to find guidelines, at least not yet, although some people may be working on them, that tell you absolutely when you should put a ventricular assist device or, or ECMO, when you should go to mechanical support. You know, in, a, in our uh, place, at least, um, uh, we uh, are always trying to balance the risks of these devices, which is largely uh, bleeding and thromboembolism. Uh, and brain injury uh, versus the support that they offer. And so we don't want to put them in three months too early. We probably are willing to put them in a day or two early um, to avoid a, a sudden event. But at the same time, uh, we don't want to put them in a day too late. Uh, and so uh, we look for patients who are at least potential candidates for transplantation, um, where there's at least some, light, some, some path to getting listed for a heart transplant that makes sense. Um, and then uh, patients who are stuck on very invasive therapies, so patients who can't be extubated because of their heart failure, uh, patients who are showing signs of early end organ dysfunction, starting to become confused, uh, or uh, inability to tolerate any kind of enteral uh, feeding, um, uh, a rising creatinine, um, those are real signs that, that uh, you're that you probably need a ventricular assist device sooner rather than later. Um, inotrope dependence is a bit more iffy. Uh, our typical approach to inotropes is we start milrinone, and if they get a bit sicker, we add a little bit of epinephrine, 0.02, 0.03 mics per kilo per minute. If they start to get sicker again, uh, then certainly uh, we move to the ventricular assist device. But if they get on the epinephrine and can't wean off, even if they're stable, we at least start conversations with the VAD team and the transplant team that a ventricular assist device is in their future, uh, and with, with the family, that a ventricular assist device is probably in their future in the next week or two uh, if a heart doesn't come through. So Steve, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful overview on how to think about the child uh, with heart failure. Thanks, Jeff. It was really a pleasure to be here.